invite you to set aside your distractions, silence your phones as we prepare our hearts and our minds for this time of worship, and David will play the prelude on our behalf. He will keep your life. 
The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Let's stand and sing a hymn of praise number 176. Your voice and your heart with mine 
at this time. And let's pray this prayer of corporate confession together. Let's pray. Amazing God, the glorious mystery of your radiance surrounds us. Yet we confess that while we praise you with our lips, we have not glorified you with our lives. We confess that we do not expect nor long for the transforming power of your love to work miracles in these hardened hearts of ours. Yet, we secretly long for a rescue, an escape, a miracle to relieve us of the responsibilities and the challenges set before us. Healing Spirit, renew our confidence in your power and in the power of love to change our lives, to lift us up from our despair and give us courage to become fully transformed persons you call us to be.
bringing joy into our lives, and we are so grateful for you and the music that you bring to our time of worship together. Uh, at this time, we're, we will turn our hearts and our minds to the Lord in prayer. Um, I went to see May yesterday. She looked considerably, considerably better from when we had seen her one week prior, uh, from one Saturday to the next. I don't know that she felt as though she was feeling a whole lot better, but just to look at her, just to see her, she looked con considerably improved. Uh, she is at home, her daughters are taking care of her, she is suffering with shingles. For those of you who do not know, this has now gone on for a number of weeks. Uh, this is, uh, she should be moving toward uh, healing soon. Usually it takes uh, three weeks or a month or so until, until you're really getting past it, from what I understand. Um, so we will keep May in our prayers this morning. Also, uh, I spoke with Bob Rathgever earlier in the week. Um, they are also at home, Bob and Marianne. Both of them are still having trouble walking and seeing to their own physical needs. Um, and feeling poorly um, and, and badly that, uh, yes, go ahead. Um, he's back in the hospital. Oh, he is. He was put back in the hospital, and then um, because his levels, his blood levels are very low, the hemoglobin is low, um, the heart, he's getting problems with the heart. Um, it's not where it should be. Okay. They found bleeding again in the GI, in the upper GI. They did? Yes. So okay. he had to be transferred to another hospital. He just got into the other hospital yesterday okay. because they did not have a GI uh, on staff over the weekend. Okay. So, but he's getting daily blood transfusions and everything. So. And that must be making some improvement in how he's feeling, I would think. Uh, right? Yeah, but, you okay. know, it's, he okay. has to get a special blood. Um, it's like a radiated blood. Okay. And it's not like they can just take it from someone who just donated it. They have to put it through a whole process. Okay. So they said it's going to be hard to do if you're at home. So I don't know what's okay. going to happen. Okay. All right. We'll keep Bob in our prayers. And Mom as well? Mom, she's, still, she's at home, thankfully. Okay. You know. um, she's doing better. She's moving around a little bit better now. Oh, good. Good. So. Good. Thank God for some improvement for her. Others this morning um, in need of prayer. Yes, Dale? I have two. First of all, Lena is doing better and put in Zoom and therapy. Okay, good. And then um, Andrew wants to buckle and take the Lord's name again. Oh, okay. So, Andrew, when is his bar exam? Tuesday and Wednesday. Okay. So travel, travel mercies, and uh, to, to, he's, did you say Wednesday? Tuesday and Wednesday. So when you lift me up in prayer on Tuesday, remember Andrew also, both of us taking tests. Okay, very good. Uh, others this morning. Yes, Arlene? Uh, Miss Debbie Wright and her family, uh, she had to leave school Friday in a rush with her daughter. Okay. And so I'm not sure, but... Okay. okay. Family situation. Others this morning? Yes, Chris? Uh, David's two sisters are in Thank you very much. And and what is they're they're not feeling well. Okay. They Ill. Okay. They need to try. Okay. Thank you. Others this morning. All right. Uh, yeah, Al? Yeah, for Turkey, Syria, Ukraine. Amen. Amen. Most definitely. Yes. Uh, all right. Um, for Claire, Claire's traveling back home. We should see her next Sunday. <laughs> so we'll keep her safe travels. In. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord together. Lord God, we thank you for the fulfillment of your word, for the keeping of your covenants, for the remembering of your promises. Lord, we thank you that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have beheld your glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
thank you for your divine power visible to us here on earth. And it is because of this that we receive power of our own and the glory that you bestow upon us and that we come together to worship and celebrate together. So Lord, we lift up this time of worship and celebration to you. We hope that it is pleasing in your sight, Lord Jesus. Help us always to be mindful of that power that lives within us and never to take it for granted. Through your word and the fulfillment of your promises, we have received the spirit that lives and dwells within us. And through that power, we then discover who we are. We hear your call upon our lives. We hear your direction for how you are calling us to be your church. Because of your redeeming love, Lord, we discover God's faithfulness to us even when we were undeserving, even while we were still sinful. And in your glory, we witness just how far God is willing to go to save us and set us free from all fear. God of abundant glory. Help us to look beyond our limitations and lift our eyes from this world's present suffering to claim the hope of our salvation. Soften our hearts to find you at work in the ways we live together as your church and in the love we share with others that it would all be done to your honor and glory. Lord, we are very mindful this day of the thousands suffering from the devastating earthquakes in Syria and Turkey, and we lift them up now to you. We pray for those who are there trying to help restore life, trying to help reunite loved ones with the deceased, Lord, we pray your safety upon them and your hope upon all of those whose lives now have been destroyed. Lord, we pray for all of those throughout the world this day whose lives are surrounded by violence in all its many forms. We pray for all the war-torn places in this world and the harm inflicted upon your children, especially for those in Ukraine. We pray for all those in our world whose hearts are hardened, those devoid of love and filled with hate. We pray for the mentally ill, those who are struggling with evil, those in need of help, and those who care for them. Lord, we ask traveling mercies this day for all who will be traveling this week, including Andrew and Claire, that they will return safely home. We lift up Andrew and the testing that he will go through this week, and we ask for clarity and peace of mind. Lord, I ask the same for myself as I face my classes exams this week. Lord, we remember this day the hungry, the homeless, the struggling, the jobless, the underemployed, all those living with daily uncertainty, and for those living in refugee camps. We pray for the sick, the elderly, and the infirmed. We lift up all of those on our church's prayer list, and specifically this day by name, we remember May and Bob, for Mary Ann and David's sisters, for Miss Debbie, and for a brother of a loved one. 
Lord, we have so much to thank and praise you for this day as well. So we thank you that Lincoln is feeling better and is back in therapy for his development and for his parents as they watch him grow. Lord, we thank and we praise you. For this congregation here, as we continue to exhibit your glory and love to a world in need of hope, Lord, may we shine forth from within us that power that you have instilled in us for your glory. And we ask that it would be used to grow us ever more into your likeness so that we would direct others to know you too. We pray for all the leaders in this world, for all of those in positions of power and authority over others, that hearts and minds would be receptive toward peace throughout the world, and the greater good would be sought over selfish ambition. We pray all these things through you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who taught us to pray, and so we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. 
But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Thanks so much. If anybody here knows me, you know I'm a mountain person. Personally, I don't know many things in this world that are as impressive as a stately mountain peak, uh, like the one on your bulletin this morning, even. There's a good example of one. I know some people prefer the ocean to feel the awe of God's powerful creation. But for me, nothing speaks as loudly of the glory of God as the majesty and the awe of a mountain peak towering above, reaching up toward the heavens. It's as if the earth itself is testifying and pointing our eyes toward God, reminding us of the presence of our Creator and the mystery that awaits each and every one of us in the far reaches of a mountaintop experience with the glory of God, our Creator. And apparently, the ancient peoples thought likewise. For the ancient Hebrews, the great mountain peaks like Mount Sinai, Bethel, Shechem, Shiloh, Mount Gerizim, and even Mount Zion, all were associated with the presence and nearness with the glory of God. They were known as the high holy places. These were the first temples where people gathered and they offered up their gifts to worship their God. And during the time of Israel's judges, the sacred tabernacle that uh, is included in our reading this morning from Exodus, if we were just to read a little farther, we find God giving uh, Moses the exact uh, way of creating this biblical tabernacle that God instructs his people to make. And the Israelites then carried that biblical tabernacle with them throughout the wilderness as they moved on for 40 years stopping and setting up the tabernacle. Eventually, as they enter the promised land, this tabernacle is then set up on Mount Shiloh, which then becomes a major religious site for the worship of Israel's God. Later, Hebrew worship was then centralized at the Hebrew temple in Jerusalem, a site within the city that sits atop the highest hill in Jerusalem, known as Mount Zion. And some of the greatest conflicts we find in the Old Testament between ancient Israel and Judah are centered around the proper location for worshiping God. Whose mountain, Israel's or Judah's, was the legitimate location for worshiping their one true God? That was a conflict between Israel and Judah for generations. And generations later, we even find the effects of that conflict. The same issue is still simmering between Jews and Samaritans. Remember the woman at the well? who speaks to Jesus and she says to him, our ancestors, the Samaritans, worshiped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. This ongoing conflict over the proper location of worshiping the one true God was still a bone of contention in the first century as the debate between Mount Gerizim and Mount Zion continued. But before there was ever a tabernacle, before there was ever a temple in Jerusalem, God first spoke to God's people 
through Moses from Mount Sinai in the wilderness. Atop this great mountain, God calls Moses to ascend. And God gives Moses the tablets of the law and the commandments atop Mount Sinai. This is the instruction for God's people for how it is that they are to worship their God. And so for 40 days, Moses goes up Mount Sinai and he stays there with God, and the people remain below, down at the bottom of the mountain, far away from the top of Mount Sinai, and they're even instructed not to touch it. Don't even touch the mountain. It's that sacred and that holy. And they wait down there below for Moses' return. And as they're waiting, and they're watching the mountain, the glory of the Lord descends upon the mountain and covers it as a cloud. The glory of the Lord appears to the people below as this glowing, consuming fire on top of the mountain. God's holy presence is visible for all to see. And there on the mountain top, within this glowing cloud of God, the voice of God speaks to Moses and tells him what to do. God's holy presence is at work in the world, setting the boundaries for life as God's people on behalf of God's people, yet still far off there in the distance on top of the mountain. Now, we jump approximately 1,500 years from Anna Maria's first reading to our second reading this morning where we find Jesus in the world, the Son of God, the Word incarnate, has now come down to us from the heavens and directly into our world. God is now living among us, teaching us face to face, performing miracles and healings. God's people are no longer separated from God's presence. God came down to our world for us from the mountaintop. God came out from the temple for us. And God has now come to us to be face to face in an intimate relationship with God as God's people. And yet still so many don't recognize him. Access and witness to God's glory expanded into our world. It grew ever closer, closer to God's people. That mountaintop experience has come down to be with us in the person of Jesus Christ. So then we might be asking ourselves this morning, why? Why does Jesus take his disciples back up the mountain to reveal to them God's glory? If we were to read in our scriptures, the verses just before the one that Anna Maria read for us this morning, verses 21 to 28, we would discover that Jesus has just revealed to his disciples for the very first time that part of God's glorious plan for our salvation includes his going to Mount Zion. And there in the holy city of God, in God's holy temple, where, where the temple resides there in Jerusalem, Jesus, the Son of God, the Word incarnate, will willingly suffer and die in order to reveal to us God's ultimate glory. And that ultimate glory is our risen Savior. But the disciples have been so shocked and so traumatized to hear this news, this part of God's glorious plan, the part about Jesus' suffering and death, that the news of God's glory, that he'll rise again in three days, 
has been completely overlooked by the disciples. All they can hear is that their beloved leader, their Jesus, will suffer and die. And they are distraught and upset by the news, particularly three of his closest disciples. So Jesus takes them up the mountain as a reminder to them of God's presence and as a symbol to them and a glimpse to them of God's ultimate glory that is to come. Clearly, this is a whole new mountaintop experience, one that includes bringing us up the mountain with God. We're no longer separated, standing below, waiting for someone else to bring us up, but Jesus himself brings us up the mountain with him. And there on that unnamed mountain with Peter and James and John, Moses and Elijah appear. And the cloud descends once again. And what at one time appeared to the Israelites who waited down on the bottom of Mount Sinai as a consuming fire that burned on top of the mountain with Moses, now glows within Jesus himself. This word of God made flesh. From the inside out, God's glory glows forth from Jesus. God's glory is revealed to his disciples. Jesus' face shines bright as the sun. His clothes become radiant and whiter than anything the disciples have ever seen in their life. It is this, this image of this glowing, radiant Christ. And then the voice of God speaks out once again. This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to what he is telling you. Listen so that you will hear and understand the whole story of his suffering and death. The time of Moses and Elijah has come to an end. The time of the law and the prophets is now being fulfilled in God's own son's suffering and death. The time of our separation from God because of our sinfulness will be no more. Because his precious blood will pay the wages of our sin, and then he will rise again. You see, the story doesn't end in Christ's suffering and death. It ends in his glory, in his resurrection. And up there on the mountain, Jesus is displaying for us, for our eyes, a glimpse of this glory to come of our own redeeming, our own forgiveness of sin, wiped away forever because of our Savior. Us, the lowly, sinful creation, have now been lifted up to the mountaintop to see and witness the power and majesty of God Almighty. Can you imagine being up there with Peter and James and John? Surely it would have been a terrifying sight, being in the presence of God's glory. The disciples were told they fall down terrified. But Jesus touches them, and he says to them, just as he says to us today, do not be afraid. You see, we, my friends, have nothing to fear. Because of Jesus, we have been drawn up, lifted up, drawn in by God Almighty to inherit our salvation as forgiven sinners. And so we then can 
witness God's glory without fear. Because of Jesus, we ourselves receive God's glory as though it is now our very own. By faith in Christ, we no longer stand off there in the distance, afraid to look, trembling. Rather, we are redeemed, shine forth this light within ourselves and proclaim it to the world, this fire and light, power that lifts our eyes to see Christ unafraid, lifts us up from all our earthly despair. And it now lives in you, in each and every one of you. The Holy Spirit of God is burning and glowing within you, removing that which no longer serves you. You see, we are the ones who are now being transfigured and transformed from the inside out by the Spirit's presence within us. The old sinful nature is now replaced with God's own glory. So my question for you today on this Transfiguration Sunday is, do you feel it? Do you see it? Do you see God's glory burning brightly within you? And Christ's own glory lives within you. Do you recognize the Spirit's power given to you for the glory of God, for all the world to see? You see, God's glory came down from heaven to the mountain. And then it came down from the mountain into our world. And now, God's glory has come from heaven and into every heart who believes in the Savior. God has never been so close to us, never so accessible to the human heart as God has done for us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our spirit is now connected directly to the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit within us, because Christ willingly died and rose again. Christ's redeeming sacrifice has given to us the most intimate connection to God ever known to humankind. And it is all for God's own glory that we receive these gifts. So that we would then praise the God of glory and live as grateful servants to the Lord who willingly did all these things to save us. Would you pray with me? Lord God, you who came down to us as the Word incarnate, you who gave the ultimate gift for our salvation. Fill us, Lord, with your glory. Make us strong and fit for the challenges that lie ahead, confident of the Spirit's power within us, transforming and transfiguring us into greater representations of your glorious love and mercy. Jesus, our Lord, make us to shine your image into the world so that others may find what we have found, the God who loves so fiercely that you came down from the mountain and out of the temple to save us. Send us, then, into the world as bearers of the holy flame of God, shining brightly for all to see. In your holy and powerful name we pray, Jesus our Savior. Amen. Would you stand with me and let's sing a hymn of response? Number 66, To God Be the Glory.
God's name and shining forth God's glory to a world in need of hope. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you this day and forevermore and bring you peace. Amen.